friends, welcome again to Panorama of Prophecy, coming to you live from the Granite Bay Hilltop Church here in Granite Bay, California. I'd like to welcome those who are joining us here in person. We're glad to see you here this morning. This is part of our Panorama of Prophecy series. Today, we're looking at lesson number 13. It's entitled, The Final Firestorm. So we are glad that you are here. Just a reminder, we do have notes that will go along with the presentation today. We hope you received it as you came in. If you don't have notes and you'd like to get some notes, Following the service, we will have them available at the back at the registration table. You're welcome to take one. And we hope you'll come back tonight. Our program continues this evening, 7 o'clock right here. And then tomorrow evening, that's Sunday evening at 7 o'clock, the program continues. Now, I was just told backstage, and also for our friends who are viewing, uh, this is something for you to take note. Tomorrow evening, the program will go live, as always, at 7 o'clock. But for our local audience here, if you want to come a little earlier on Sunday evening, at 6.30, we have Jamie George, who's going to be bringing us some wonderful violin music. So that's going to be happening at 6.30 on Saturday, uh, Sunday evening, I should say. So come a little bit earlier tomorrow, and you can receive that blessing. We'd like to tell our friends about our free gift that we have today. It's a book entitled, Hellfire, A Twisted Truth Untangled. This is our free offer. And we'll be happy to send this to anyone. Just text the word HELL to the number 40544, and you will get a digital download of the book. If you're outside of North America and you'd like to read the book, well, just go to the panoramaofprophecy.com website. You can download the book, Hellfire, A Twisted Tale, and that goes along with our subject for today. So again, take advantage of that. Some folks here have asked, they said, well, how do we contribute to the finances of putting on a seminar like this? We want to let our local audience know that following the service, there will be some ushers. They'll have some offering bags, and you're welcome to put something in as you leave today. For our friends who are watching online, if you'd like to contribute, you can go to the Amazing Facts website. And friends, don't forget our partner ministries that are helping to broadcast this program. We think of 3ABN, Hope Channel, and some others. So if you'd like to help contribute to that, just go visit their websites as well, and you can make a donation. Again, we are glad you are here. We're excited about the presentation today. And as we always do, we like to start by singing our theme song. So let's stand. As we sing together, John Loma Cain Kelly will lead us in the music for today. me to know your will, Lord, that I might follow thee. Make me to hear that still small voice tenderly calling me. If wind and waves start mountain, speak the words, peace be still. Give me the mind of Jesus, show me the truth that frees us. I want to do what pleases you, so help me to know your will. Lord, please help me to know your will. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for this beautiful Sabbath that you've given us. Thank you for the opportunity for us to gather together and worship you and to study an important topic, an important subject found in the book of Revelation. So, Father, we ask for your Spirit's guidance. Be with Pastor Doug as he opens the Word. And be with those who are watching, wherever they might be. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Again, one of our parts of the program that we enjoy is taking Bible questions. For those of you who are here locally, you can write down your Bible question on a piece of paper, get it to one of our, our volunteers, or you can just turn it in at the registration table on your way out, and we'll try to answer as many of these questions throughout the program. For our friends who are watching online, just go to the Panorama of Prophecy website, and you can send us your Bible question. Or if you're watching on social media or on YouTube, you can just type your question right in the comment section. We have people that are going through that. They'll gather those questions and give it to Pastor Doug and Karen, and we'll try to answer as many as we can. Well, with that, we'd like to invite Pastor Doug and Karen, and they'll lead in the Bible questions today. Thank you, Pastor Ross and uh, everybody. Welcome. So glad to see you here. And we know that we, we yeah, have... Um, she said, I got to move over. This is the story of my life. That's the middle. Okay. <laughs> This is the middle. You see those little black things? That's, that's the middle. Good morning, everyone. We want to welcome you. We know we have a lot of visitors that are here at the Granite Bay Hilltop Church as well as 
Uh, a lot of folks who are watching uh, various hours, you know, it's a little later in Europe for people watching, earlier in Hawaii, but we get messages from all over the world, people watching it live. Others are watching the rebroadcast on Facebook or YouTube or one of the other sites. And it's just wonderful to have this global Bible study. Amen? Amen. So thank you for joining us this morning. All right. Well, our first question comes from last night. You were talking about baptism, and people have asked, what is profession of faith? Okay, there may be some people who want to, we talked about baptism and joining a church. Some people were maybe baptized by immersion, but they didn't join a church or they feel led to join a different church. They're wondering, do I need to be baptized again? Not necessarily. Most denominations that practice baptism by immersion will welcome a believer from one church to another by what they call profession of faith. You say, I've committed my life to Jesus. I've been baptized. I'd like to join the church by profession of faith. And uh, they can simply be voted in then at that time. All right. Is it necessary to get rebaptized if one has never truly turned away from the knowledge or th and acknowledgement of Christ, but spent several years not attending church and compromising their Christian lifestyle? Do they rejoin the church by profession of faith if they never really left it? Well, if you say you stop attending church and you're living for the world for several years, you've kind of left the church. You may have still have your name on the books, and you may have in your mind and heart still believed its teachings, but you're not, you know, your, your friends and neighbors all see you living like the world. It's not a very good witness. You come back again, you may want to say, look, I've reconsecrated my life. I'd say talk to your pastor. Now, if a person gets discouraged and for a month or two they miss church or, or um, they have something that they need to repent of, the Lord's provided where we have the communion service and even a foot washing service mm -hmm. where you can renew your commitment. It's like a little mini baptism. Uh, so I'd say you need to talk to your pastor because that may change a little bit from case to case. What will be the role of the Holy Spirit after the second coming? Are there scriptures to support the role of the Holy Spirit in heaven and the new earth? Well, we talked about the importance of the Holy Spirit in um, the conversion process, following baptism, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit's been there from cover to cover in the Bible. You look in Genesis, it says, and the Spirit of God moved on the face of the waters. And then you get to Revelation long after we're in heaven. It says, and the Spirit and the bride say, come, and whosoever will let him come. And so as we travel through the cosmos, the principal way that we're going to be connected with God the Father and the Son is through God the Spirit. And so the work of God the Spirit is going to be just as important there. It's the Spirit that fills us with joy and bliss and uh, just the worship. And so, of course, God the Spirit's going to be doing all of those functions in heaven as well. He just doesn't have to bring conviction. Well, there us. won't be conviction of sin. That's right. And, of course, Jesus' function changes a little. He's not going to be suffering for sin. And so that part of redemption is over, but the Godhead is eternal. What do you do with an old Bible that has fallen apart? How do I dispose of it? Uh, I heard someone say one time, a Bible that is falling apart usually belongs to a person who is not falling apart. Uh, but you, you know, sometimes you do get a Bible and it's damaged or pages fall out and it gets beyond repair and because it's a holy book, you don't want to throw it in the, in the uh, compost of your kitchen. Uh, I, you know, and there's no scripture that really says exactly what happens, but typically I think they burn them, and they figure that way it will not appear to be disrespected or broken in pieces or in a garbage heap somewhere, so they're burned. They also say that, um, and again, this is a church tradition, so I can't really give you a scripture, but in most churches, when you have the communion service, if there is some of the unleavened bread left over, the grape juice they pour on the ground, the unleavened bread they burn. So I'm guessing with the Bible, that's the appropriate way to dispose of it. What is a good age for a young person to get baptized? Very good question. I'm glad that came in. We talked about baptism. Uh, the Bible's pretty clear that uh, uh, baptizing babies is not biblical. The appropriate thing, if you're parents of a newborn, is you dedicate your child to the Lord. Baptism is something uh, that they must decide. And we read in the Bible, they must be taught. Uh, they're repenting of their sins. They're confessing that they believe in Jesus with all their heart. Uh, clearly, an infant can't do these things. So at what age are they old enough to be baptized? You know, I believe it may vary from child to child. If you were to look for a round number, 
Well, Jesus went to the sanctuary when he was 12. And so you figure that uh, a child was considered to be entering into adulthood during that time. Today in the Jewish tradition, bar mitzvahs happen at 13 or bas mitzvah for a girl. Mm -hmm. um, I think that changed. It used to be 12 and somewhere in the last 2,000 years it moved to 13. But, um, you know, you might baptize a child younger than that. Uh, someone asked a pastor one time, uh, how old should a child be when they're baptized? What's the age? He said, when they're old enough to be lost, they're old enough to be saved. Uh, when they know the difference between good and evil, when they understand the claims of the gospel, when they understand the sacrifice of Christ, and what I always ask a young candidate, do they have their own personal devotional time? Mm -hmm. If they're not having their own personal devotional time, reading the Bible, in prayer, they're probably not ready. And now they may make a decision when they're five years old to give their heart to Jesus. Mm -hmm. And if something happens, if they should, God forbid, die before they get baptized at 10, 11, 12, whatever it is, then they'll be saved. You know what I'm saying? So it's not like God is going to say, well, I know you accepted me, but you didn't go through the ceremony of baptism, so I can't save you. God looks on the heart. But before they make that public commitment of consecration and baptism, uh, they need to be able to fulfill the Bible criteria. Repenting of their sins, being able to understand the gospel, uh, demonstrating conversion in their lives, and um, believing with all their heart. All right, thank you. Does Jesus have a last name? I used to think Christ was his last name. Uh, you know, growing up, I heard the two used together frequently, not always in the right uh, context. <laughs> but um, no, you know, they, the closest you get to a last name in the Bible is they would often talk about the profession. A lot of people out there have names like Baker. That means someone in your family was Baker and you were John the Baker. Uh, you might be Smith. They were usually blacksmiths or Miller. They milled grain. Don't ask me how I got the name Bachelor. That doesn't make any sense at all. But, um, and, and so Jesus was called Jesus the son of Joseph or it, Jesus the carpenter's son. And sometimes I know families named Carpenter. And so they would identify you either with your family trade or your town, Jesus of Nazareth. A lot of people get their last name from the town they're from or from their family's occupation. So otherwise he's just known as Yahshua. His name was Yahshua. We typically use the Greek pronunciation, which is Jesus. Who are the two witnesses of Revelation 11? Yes, I'll try and give you a quick answer because I can't take you know, all of our time to talk about this whole chapter. But it does talk about these two witnesses. Some have wondered, is it Moses and Elijah that uh, they have all this power and then they die and three and a half days later they rise again and they send up to heaven? Moses and Elijah um, that you find in the last prophecy of the Old Testament. Remember the law of Moses? Behold, I send you Elijah the prophet, Malachi chapter four. Um, they represent the word of God. Moses and Elijah appeared to Jesus in Mark chapter nine on the Mount of Transfiguration to endorse that Christ was the Messiah. That is a symbol that the word of God, the law, Moses, the prophets, Elijah, endorse Jesus as the Messiah. There's an attack in history on the word of God, the law and the prophets. The Bible is often given in the context of two. You got a sword with two edges, 10 commandments, two tables of stone. Uh, the Bible tells us in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. The word of God is dual in its nature. And so uh, the two witnesses are the word of God. You notice it says the characteristics are, it says these have the power to shut up the heavens that it does not rain, quoting from Revelation 11. Well, that happened in the time of Elijah. Moses foretold in his prophecy famine. It says that they can call plagues and fire. Happened during the time of Moses, happened during the time of Elijah. And so it's a symbol for the word of God and an attack on the word of God around the time when atheism was born whole nother study we'd love to share with you. Well, you're going to talk about that later on in the prophecy. We don't have a whole study just on that chapter, but maybe I'll give more insights as we proceed in another study. Is it possible for the use of technology or supernatural means to be used to spread the gospel to places around the world, making up for where man comes short? Well, the Lord is using supernatural means all the time. When you just think about God's spirit and angels working in cooperation with people, to spread the gospel. As far as technology, yes. 
you know, we're looking He's at what we're right doing now. now. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But this is not the first time. Do you realize what happened with the proclamation of the gospel when the Roman roads were built? Mm -hmm. The gospel of Jesus came at a great time in history because there was a network of Roman roads all around the center of civilization surrounding the Mediterranean, and that really helped enhance the rapid spread. You can call that technology. The printing press during the time of Gutenberg. Few things have done more to spread the gospel and cause reformation than when people could have the word of God in their own language and in their own hands. And then, you know, with rapid communications, uh, telephone and radio and television and internet, these are tools that can be used for good or bad, mm -hmm. but uh, they can also be used to spread the gospel around the world. So we trust that's happening now. We're doing everything we can with this series. We're giving printed material. We're streaming on television. These programs will be on radio, on the internet. It's going by satellite, by land-based stations, and this is just wonderful to see how the gospel is screaming around the world right now through this technology. These angels are giving a loud cry in the last days. Amen. How do we keep the Sabbath? Please help me understand Isaiah 58, 13, the phrase, not finding your own pleasure on the Sabbath. Yeah, in Isaiah 58, it says, if you turn away your foot from the Sabbath from doing your pleasure on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight. So when he says, turn away your foot from doing your pleasure, you think, oh, that means I'm only supposed to do things that are unpleasant. No, he goes on to say, call it a delight. The word there, the phrase, your pleasure, it means your own personal pursuits. The Sabbath is a day to dedicate your time for God in his pursuits. But you should take pleasure in that. Amen. And you should delight in that. I mean, it's wonderful on the Sabbath when people get together and they fellowship. Mm -hmm. I love to see how folks just brighten up as they reconnect with each other. It's wonderful to get together and share good food. It's wonderful to get rest. Take that nap you've been missing all week long to recharge your battery. And so the Sabbath is a blessing. It's not a burden, right? But it means avoiding your own personal or secular pursuits and going after that which is holy. We should not be shopping. It's hard to have your mind focused. You shouldn't have any secular television on. You can watch Amazing Facts and 3ABN and Hope Ch Channel and Secrets Unsealed Ministries and Better Life Television. You know, so you can use the mediums for good things, but we should avoid, se avoid secular things. We read good books, Christian books, inspirational books, any secular newspapers or magazines, we just put them out of sight because you want your head focused on holy things. It's, it's quality time with God. So Bible study together, enjoying yeah. nature together, this spending is, time with, mm -hmm. with other people, sharing, sharing the gospel and, and uh, how the Lord is working in your life Absolutely. are good ideas. There's a lot of folks that can't make it to church because of their health or their shut-ins or their aged. Good time to go visit and encourage those people too. Amen? Yes. All right. Are we ready for our last question or do you need a little more? Oh, no, we can do one more. Depends okay. on which question you give me. Well, I'm going to choose this one. Aren't we filled with the Holy Spirit when we accept Jesus? If not, how must we go about receiving the Holy Spirit? And how will I know when I am filled? Well, when you're baptized with the Holy Spirit, you will know. It's like someone says, how do I know I'm in love? Well, you gotta ask that question. You're not in love yet. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but we do receive the Holy Spirit in different degrees. Mm -hmm. And so you have the Holy Spirit that comes to you that brings conviction. It may not be a warm, fuzzy feeling. It, it brings conviction. The Holy Spirit will sometimes lead and guide. God's Spirit works in our lives all through our lives. But there's a special filling of the Spirit that often happens with baptism. The Bible promise is pretty clear. Peter says, repent, Acts chapter 2. Mm -hmm. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the promise is unto you and your children, and as many as the Lord God shall call. Now, you may not receive a baptism of the Spirit like they did at Pentecost, but God will give you the Holy Spirit as he did to his own son to live a new life and with a new ministry. Christ began his ministry, a spirit-filled ministry, at his baptism. And it doesn't mean you won't be tempted. Was Jesus tempted after he was filled with the Spirit? Yes. Yeah. When the children of Israel were baptized in the Red Sea, were they still attacked when they got in the wilderness? Mm -hmm. So when pastors tell Christians, get baptized and everything's going to be a bowl of cherries, it's not being honest. You'll still have resistance, but you're going to have God's power within you helping you. And you also have the fruits of the Spirit. That is another yes. way that shows that you have Christ living in you. And fruits can be that big and then they grow. Mm 
That's right. So they may start small, but they can grow. All right, I think that is our last question. Is that okay, all right? Sure. Okay. All right. Today we're going to be blessed with a special music by Pastor John Lomakang, Kelly Maurer, and they're going to be sharing God Leads His Dear Children Home. In shady green pastures, so rich and so sweet, God leads His dear children along. Where the waters cool flow, He bathes the weary. God leads His children along. Some through the water and some through the flood, some through the fire, but all through His blood. sorrows but God gives a song in the night season and all the day long with sorrows before us and Satan opposed, God leads his dear children along. But through faith we will conquer and will defeat all our foes as God leads his children. song in a night season in your night season and all the day Thank you, John and Kelly. Beautiful song. God leads us along. Welcome, friends, to the Panorama of Prophecy program. We're so thankful that you're here. And it's good to have uh, people gathered together in the house of the Lord on the day of the Lord to study the word of the Lord. Amen? Amen. And uh, today's presentation, uh, we're going to be talking about the subject of the punishment of the wicked, but it is actually the good news about hell that we're going to be sharing lesson is titled, The Final Firestorm. But before we get into the lesson, we always like to begin with a historical from the Bible. These are Bible stories that help illustrate Bible truths. And uh, you find this story in the book of Genesis. Now, the lesson is called, The Final Firestorm. You remember Lot and his uncle Abraham settled in the Promised Land. God blessed their flocks and herds so much that they just could not dwell together anymore. And Abraham said, we don't want to argue, we are brethren. And so what happened is uh, Abraham said, Lot, you go to the right hand, I'll go to the left, you decide where you want to go. And it says that he lifted his eyes towards Sodom and he directed his attention towards the valley because there's a lot of pasture back then. Even though 
the Bible's pretty clear that the men of Sodom, and this is Genesis 13, 13, were wicked exceedingly. Now, I don't know if you're aware, but God had actually spared Sodom once before, and they'd been rescued by Abraham. He delivered the cities when they'd been attacked by the Assyrian ar armies in the north. God gave them another chance, but they did not repent. And they went deeper and deeper into sin and wickedness. And um, eventually God sent two angels to Lot. He said, get your family out of this place because God is going to destroy it for its wickedness. Lot tried to persuade his grown daughters that were married to come with him. And they thought that he was mocking. They wouldn't take him seriously. Finally, the angel said, time's almost up. And the angels took Lot and his two daughters and his wife by the hand one angel had two in each hand and physically pulled them out of the city and said, escape for your life. Do not look behind you. Very explicit command. Nor stay anywhere in the plain. Escape to the mountains lest you be destroyed. Now, you know, that language reminds me of where Jesus said, speaking of the last days, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, let him that reads understand those that be in Judea flee into the mountains. And there's going to be a time when God's people may need to get out of Dodge because things are going to be very bad in the major cities of the world during that time. A lot of cities uh, are very similar to those cities of the plain. The angel said, escape for your life. Do not look behind you. Escape to the mountains. And as they were going back towards the mountain, the Bible tells us, then the Lord rained brimstone, that's like sulfur, and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. Later you read where Abraham said, or it says that Abraham looked towards Sodom and Gomorrah. There were actually four or five cities down there, Zoar and the other word, they're very small. But the principal cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, and behold, the smoke of the land, which went up like the smoke of a furnace, he saw the judgment, and Abraham was praying that Lot and his family had made it out alive. But while their, their bodies had made it out of Sodom, their hearts were still there. And as they were heading up towards the hills, Lot's wife could not resist the temptation. And it says, Lot's wife looked back behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. Now, that area today is known for its salt deposits around the Dead Sea. And um, she died for that judgment. We don't know why she looked back. We don't know if she was missing the life with the shopping malls. She may have been thinking of her children that had been left behind. But it's interesting that one of the shortest verses in the Bible is Jesus speaking of the last days, when the time comes when people have to flee. And he said, remember Lot's wife, three words. When God calls us to follow him, to turn our back on the world, he said, do not go back to your house. Do, if you're in the field, don't go back and get your cloak. There may be a time when we've got to get up and run in the last days. When we see the abomination of desolation, it's what it says in um, Matthew and Luke, it says, when you see Jerusalem encompassed with armies, let those that be in Judea flee into the mountains. So this, what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah became a, a symbol of how God is going to deal with wickedness in the last days. The Bible says that the heavens and the earth will be dissolved with fervent heat. Now, I want to show you something that I think you'll find incredible. I wish I could pass it around, but uh, Mrs. Bachelor's got an artifact for me, and uh, we'll do our best to get this on camera. I've got some friends that have done some excavation in the area around the Dead Sea, and they've sent me a few of these. These are only found one place in the world. These are sulfur balls. And you'll see it's a little scorched on one side because I did a demonstration in one church to show them that it is a pure sulfur ball and put a match to it and it lit and then I blew it out right away. But the whole room filled with the smell of rotten eggs. Have you ever? And I, and I started to gag for the rest of the sermon. I said, I'm not doing that anymore. But a matter of fact, it's so bad that I even brought out a hanky here to wipe my fingers off after holding it up for you. These are found all over the area. Well, actually, there's a restricted area that is down at the southern end of the Dead Sea. There's no other place where they are embedded in ash, and they fell from the heavens. 
when they entered the ground, they were extinguished. And you can find them today and set them on their sulfur bowls. Brimstone is what this is. In that very area where God said it was going to happen. Yeah, we'll take that down so we don't have this shiny horse trough on the stage for the whole program. So, what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah is a symbol for how God is going to deal with the wicked in the last days. Now, you might be a little bit apprehensive, oh, Pastor Doug, you're going to be talking about hell. I think you're going to be encouraged when you find out what the Bible teaches about this regarding the justice and the love of God. But as our custom is, we're going to find out what uh, people on the street have to say about this subject. And so why don't we go ahead and roll our man on the street and uh, let's, let's get some of the different ideas that you might find out there in society about what does the Bible say about hell or what are their thoughts about this subject? I think hell is whatever you make it in a way. Um, I think everybody has their own personal hell that is unique to them and what could be hell for you might be heaven for somebody else. It's talked about as a lake of fire, a lot of, uh, some other imagery. Not a lot is said about hell, but um, I think there's enough to know that we don't want to go there. <laughs> so. <laughs> there's a lot of fire. I mean, nobody wants to be burning forever and, and not be able to die. So it's, it's, it's a forever torturous thing for the soul. I think for me, it, the way I can describe it is separation from Christ, separation from our Savior. Hell is the complete absence of uh, being in touch with your fellow humanity. Uh, that is complete isolation uh, and beyond that a darkness and a coldness. I don't believe that people burn in hell. I'm not really sure if hell even exists. People try not to think about hell as much as they think about heaven, but I, I think that like hell would just probably be a different experience for everyone, depending on how you lived your life. And um, according to the sins that sent you to hell in the first place, that would kind of affect your experience. I don't know how long people burn in hell for. I don't, I don't know. I don't know the specifics about hell. That's, mm. The Bible says eternity. Mm. The Bible says eternity. Well, there's an interesting spectrum of different ideas that people have on this. I think I shared with you the night that we talked about heaven, that there are about twice as many people that believe in heaven as those who believe in hell. And that's understandable because there are two incredible extremes that are out there in the world and even in the church regarding hell. One teaching says that if you're bad and you die, you go immediately to a place of everlasting torment where you will be plunged into a lake of fire and brimstone and you will have every nerve ending in your body sensing this incredible agony and pain and you'll be writhing in this molten fire and brimstone, compounded by the anguish that you could have been saved, but you are not. And that terrible experience will not go on for a moment or two or a minute or two, but forever and ever. Now, just the thought of that, I think, can make someone blow a gasket. Think about that. Who would want to burn for a minute? Can you imagine burning for a billion years. And then after a billion years go by, you swim to the surface of the molten lava and you say, Lord, how long? And he laughs and says, how long? You haven't even started. Eternally. That's one view. The other view is that uh, hell is just uh, the bad memories of what happened here on earth that are going to bother you or that some of the wicked might be um, vaporized, uh, you know, at the end and then they're gone. Between these two extremes, you'll find the Bible truth. There is a true teaching on hell and the lake of fire. You find that in Revelation chapter 20. You also find it in Revelation 22, but, uh, and all through the teachings of Jesus as well. But we're going to find out what the Bible says. Fair enough? To go to the first question in our lesson. What two cities are given as an example for the destruction of the wicked? In our opening story, we looked at those two cities. You read in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 6, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes. Into what? Turn them into ashes, condemn them to destruction, ashes, destruction, 
making them an example to those who afterward live ungodly. So if we want to see an example of what's going to happen to the wicked, it says, look at what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. They were destroyed. They were turned to ashes. Now here's my question. Are they still burning today? But the Bible tells us they were burnt with eternal fire. The results of the fire were eternal. They're not still burning now. They were burnt up. They were destroyed. They were turned to ashes, never rebuilt. So question number two, when will the wicked be destroyed in hellfire? Let's find out what the Bible says on that. Second Peter 2 verse 9, the Lord knows how to reserve the unjust unto the day, uh, un unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. If you call a restaurant and say, I'd like to reserve a table, that means they're holding it for you till you get there. And this is the same way it is with the wicked, that people are reserved for the day of judgment. They're not there yet. The judgment day has not happened yet. When is that? John 12, 48, Jesus said, the word that I have spoken will judge him. When? The last day. In fact, I'm going to grab my Bible real quick. If you've got your Bible or your digital Bible, go to John chapter 6. I want to just show you something. It's amazing to me people don't catch this. John chapter 6, these are all the words of Jesus. Start with, oh, verse 39. This is the will of my Father who sent me, that all he has given me I should lose nothing, but raise it up the last day. Verse 40, I will raise him up the last day. You go to verse 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up the last day. Go to verse 54. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I'll raise him up the last day. And I could go on all through the New Testament. It is so clear that people do not receive their rewards until the end, the day of the Lord. It's called the judgment day, the last day. It is future when there's this recompense that is given to the righteous and the wicked. You can read in Matthew chapter 10. This is the parable where he talks about the wheat and the tares. Uh, sorry, Matthew 13, verse 40. So it will be at the end of this age, the Son of Man will send out his angels and they will gather together those who practice lawlessness. That's the evil, correct? Yes. At the end of the age, he'll send his angels to gather together the, the wicked, cast them into a furnace of fire. Okay, that can't be misunderstood. Do the wicked experience fire? Yes. Uh, we'll find out what happens. But when is that? Is anyone burning in hell now? No. The Bible says it's, it's future. So considering that, question number three, if the wicked who have died are not in hell yet, where are they? Let's the, let the Bible describe it. John 5, 28, Jesus is speaking here. The hour is coming. He's speaking future tense. The hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice. These are the resurrections, all good and evil. Future, they're going to hear his voice. They that have done good, the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil, the resurrection of condemnation. And so we got the dead in Christ rise first, and then the only ones left are the dead out of Christ, which is the lost or the wicked. They're in a second resurrection. The Bible is very clear. There's two distinct separate resurrections. You'll want to come to our study on the millennium that we're having tonight. Don't miss that. It's, we're getting uh, into some industrial strength, great Bible study from Revelation 20, but it talks about the two resurrections. Christ is very clear. This is in the future. And again, look in Job 21, verse 30 and 32. The wicked are reserved for the day of doom. He will be brought to the grave. Where is he brought? To the grave. And a vigil kept over the tomb. He's reserved. He's going to be brought to the grave until he comes forth in the second resurrection. Question number four. What is the reward or punishment for sin? According to the Bible, it tells us the wages of sin is death and the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, I just need to tell you, friends, this to me is one of the favorite sermons for me. Because growing up, I didn't have a lot of religious training, but my parents did send me to a couple of different Christian schools. And in those schools, they said, if you're good, you know, the principal teaching, you're good, you die, you go to heaven. You're bad, you die, you go to the other place. Well, I was curious. I said, tell me about that other place. Well, you'll be thrown into fire and you're going to burn 
forever and ever. And when I heard that, I don't remember how old I was. I was pretty young. I, I just couldn't comprehend. I said, you're telling me God is love in one class. In another class, you're saying that if I'm bad, I go to hell. And I said, let me see if I understand this. Everybody sins? Yeah, all have sinned except Jesus. So we're born with sort of a predisposition to sin. We didn't choose to be born. God created us. And if we can't get it right, he's then going to burn these disobedient children forever and ever and ever and ever for the sins of one brief lifetime. Matter of fact, it, it didn't make sense to me. I said, you telling me that I'm eight years old or 10 years old and I die, I'm going to go to hell and I'm going to burn as long as Adolf Hitler? So that doesn't sound fair. I thought God was a sadist. I turned away from God. When I found out the Bible truth on this, it liberated me to love God. I realized that God was a just and a loving God, and that's why this subject was just so dear to my heart, because I know there's others out there like that. Amazing Facts got a letter from a teenage girl. She said, I have been living in constant fear of death, that I wouldn't be good enough, and I would die lost, and I was going to be tortured forever and ever in fire. And when I heard this presentation, she said, the burden finally lifted. My depression is gone. I realized I can love the Lord, and now I'm a joyful Christian. Once people understand this subject, I mean, I don't think folks realize how horrific that first view is that people are tortured in burning fire. There is hellfire, but the Bible says the wicked are burnt up. You can read Malachi chapter 4. Behold, the day comes that will burn as an oven. All the proud and all that do wickedly. How many? All will be stubble. The day that comes will burn them up. There'll be neither root nor branch. It's pretty clear that the wicked are burnt up in hellfire. Didn't God say to Adam and Eve that they were not permitted to eat from the tree of life lest they live forever? Man is not naturally immortal. You've got two choices. You've got either life through Jesus or death. Whoever believes in him might have eternal life. Now, if the penalty for sin, what did we just read the penalty for sin is? The wages for sin are death. Good enough. But what if the penalty for sin is everlasting burning in fire, how could Jesus pay the penalty for our sin? He didn't pay the penalty for our sin. He died on the cross. He suffered. He died. He rose. See what I'm saying? The penalty is death. What are the only two choices for all of mankind? The Bible tells us, whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So if you do not believe, what does it say? Perish. By the way, you got a picture of Moses holding up the bronze serpent there because when Jesus said these words, he was talking to Nicodemus and he said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, that whoever believes, believed would not perish but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes might not perish but have everlasting life. He's very clear. Perish. Some of you have got things in your refrigerator because they're called perishables. And if they're not, some of you have things in your refrigerator that perished a long time ago, and they're still there. But the reason is you try to prevent them from perishing. And otherwise, they decompose, they rot, they turn back into the elements of the earth, cease to exist. That's what it means by perish. Eternal life, God didn't say, you got two choices, believe in me, eternal life in heaven, don't believe me, eternal life in hell. You are not immortal. The Bible tells us immortality is a gift that God gives to the believers through faith. God and God only hath immortality. I'm quoting scripture here. If the penalty for sin is eternal burning, then Jesus did not pay the full price. That to me, I think, is a, a slam dunk truth. The penalty for sin is death. Jesus paid our penalty. Question number six. What will happen to the wicked that are in hellfire? For yet a little while, and the wicked shall be no more. The wicked shall perish. Into smoke they will vanish away. I mean, you look at the terminology that God uses to describe the punishment of the wicked, and it's really clear. It says they are burned up, they perish, they're ashes, they're consumed, they're devoured, they vanish away. I mean, it is so clear, and yet there are some difficult verses, and we're going to look at those. But people are ignoring the preponderance of evidence that says that the wicked don't get eternal life. They're going to be burned up. 
and they focus on a couple of obscure scriptures because the church found about 900 years ago that they could use this terror of hell to manipulate people. Uh, you know, people in power often know that fear is a, is a very strong motivator. Some people actually give money to have the church pray to get their loved ones in purgatory out. You could see, well, that would be easy to be exploited, right? For financial gain. I remember when uh, John Lennon was shot that um, Yoko Ono actually went to the Catholic Church and said, you know, what gift could be given that he could be prayed out of purgatory? Because he had made very clear atheistic statements. And they said, his, his sin is actually too much. We're not going to pray for him. Does anyone remember that? Yeah. Yeah, he one time said, we are greater than God, and the church would, wouldn't forgive him for that. But people were wondering, can you make a, you know, can you pay to have someone say a prayer, do a mass, burn a candle to get people out of this purgatory and, and get them on? And so it was exploited. Psalm 37, verse 10 and 20. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall be no more. They'll perish, they'll vanish away. I think I just read that. I want to read Malachi 4.1. The day is coming that will burn as an oven, and all that do wickedly will be stubble. The day that comes will burn them up. When something's burn up, what's left? It's gone. You shall trample the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet. This week, Karen and I were up in the hills, and we were doing some cleaning, and we bought a, a refrigerator, and we had this big refrigerator box. And we said, what are we going to do with this big old cumbersome box? And we said, it rained up here. Let's start a fire. It was amazing how quickly that refrigerator box had disappeared and blew away when you burn it. Perish. Good luck finding it now. It's gone with the wind, as they say. Where will healthy fire be located? In Granite Bay. <laughs> and in Washington, D.C. Probably a little hotter there. And in San Francisco. Hellfire is on Earth. People, it's not in the Earth. I remember, I hope you don't buy them, but sometimes, you know, at the checkout stand, they got those tabloid magazines. And... Um, I was in line and I saw the headline. I was real tempted to buy it to use for a sermon illustration. And it said, oil drillers in Siberia drill too deep and they reach hell. <laughs> Demons escape. Because a lot of people have this uh, idea that, you know, the devil is in charge of this dark cavern down there. You know, they, they got the god Vulcan. They saw a volcano. That's where you get the word because this fire would come up out of the earth. And they thought the devil, they kind of got him mixed up with Greek mythology and said, yeah, he's like the god Vulcan. He's in charge of how people get burned in hell. Is that what the Bible teaches? No. There's so many myths that have come from mythology. Revelation 20, verse 9, where is hell going to burn? They went up on the breadth of the earth, surface of the earth, and surrounded the camp of the saints. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. That fire rains down on the earth everywhere surrounding the New Jerusalem. It's going to be fire raining up until it rains down and forms a lake. You can also read in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. The whole surface of the planet is going to be purified by fire. So the fire is on the surface of the earth in the last days. It's not a chamber off in the cosmos somewhere, and it's not down yonder in a deep hole. It's on the surface of the earth. Will the devil be in charge of hellfire? I just touched on that, but nowhere in the Bible, you know, people think that the devil's got this pitchfork because it's like a barbecue. He's making sure everyone cooks evenly. And could you trust the devil to be fair that people got their just rewards? Do you know the Bible says there are varying rewards? Jesus said, he that knew his master's will and did not do it will be beaten with many stripes, while he that uh, knew his master's will or did not know his master's will and did not do it will be beaten with few stripes. And Jesus says, great is your reward in heaven. And then he also says, it is more severe for others. Jesus said, it is, he told Pilate, it's going to be more severe for the one who delivered me to you, Judas, than for you. So there are varying degrees of punishment. There are varying degrees of reward. If everybody that goes to hell gets thrown in the same furnace forever, they're all getting the same reward. 
But the Bible's pretty clear that's not the way it's going to be. And praise the Lord, the devil is not in charge. Matter of fact, the devil is afraid of it. You read in Revelation 20, verse 10, the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. Now, as we go through this, I, I'm hoping that lights are going off in your mind and saying, boy, I had never thought of this before. I remember one time our family was driving across Texas, in, in near Lubbock, Texas, and, and um, it was the day before Christmas Eve. Driving along in this little Mazda GLC, I still drive a Mazda, and uh, this little bitty rice burner car, there's a great big like Oldsmobile or Cadillac on the side of the road with the hood up, and I used to do mechanic work, so I thought, well, we'll pull over, it was, you know, cold, and, and I talked to the man, and he, he and his wife and two girls, and he said, uh, yeah, it won't start, the lights, headlights went out, and it just died, and I looked at it, and I said, your battery's dead, and I think your alternator's not charging, because we couldn't even jump it. I said, look, I'll tow you, which was the funniest thing you've ever seen. This little two-wheel drive Mazda towing this big Texas boat miles back to our house. And I said, look, it's too late to do anything about it, but I think I can fix your alternator. Why don't you spend the night, and, and we'll see if we can find an auto parts store open tomorrow. Turns out he was a Baptist pastor. I said, well, praise the Lord. And... Um, and so we got into a Bible study. I wasn't a pastor then. I was just doing auto work construction. And, and um, I said, well, you know, let's talk about this subject of hell. You're a Baptist. You talk. And we got into a little Bible study. I started sharing these scriptures with them. The Bible says they're consumed. They're burnt up. They perish. Never will they be. No more pain. They're devoured. Ashes. They'll consume away. And he got real quiet. And he said, you know, Brother Doug, he's a very nice man. He said, I've seen these verses before. And he said, you know, when you read it this way, he said, it sounds really clear. He said, but if I told my church this, they wouldn't come back to church if they thought the hell didn't burn forever. I said, brother, are you telling me they're coming for fire insurance? They're coming because they're afraid of burning? Now, wanting to go to heaven and avoiding hell might be a suitable starting point, but heaven forbid the church is full of people that are just trying to stay out of the fire. Do you want to go to church because you're afraid of the fire or because you love God? Love needs to be the motive. Number nine, will the fires of hell ever go out? You can read here in Isaiah chapter 47, verse 14. It says, it shall not be a coal to be warmed by, nor a fire to sit before. It's consumed. There's be nothing left. The fire burns up. Number 10. Now, if there's a verse that's clear to me, this is a clear verse. I've had people say, yeah, Pastor Doug, you're right. The, the bodies burn up. The bodies are consumed. The bodies turn to ashes. But their soul burns forever. Maybe some of you have heard that. Yeah, well, it's not a physical torment. It's their souls that are being tormented. But listen to what Jesus said. Matthew chapter 10, 28. Do not fear those who kill the body, but they cannot kill the soul but rather fear him whom soul, who is able to destroy soul and body in hell. What happens to that individual? Jesus said, soul, body, destroy, perish, ashes. You shall consider their place and they will not be found, it tells us. The devil, see, the first lie the devil told Adam and Eve, you won't really die. You will not surely die. That means you will not really die. You'll live forever. You're immortal. You're like God, just like I want to be. You'll either have heaven forever or you're going to have hell forever, but you're not going to surely die. Many pastors are repeating the lie of the devil in their churches that you will not surely die. The Bible says the soul that sins, Leviticus, I'm sorry, Ezekiel 18, the soul that sins, it will die. We got two choices. Moses said when he stood before the people, Deuteronomy 31, I stand before you this day, and on one hand I've got life and good and blessing, the other hand I've got death and evil and cursing, choose life. You've got life or death, eternal life or perish, new body or ashes. So, can you tell I get excited about this? This idea of eternal torment is just a horrific teaching that the, the reason I think it also bothers me, it distorts the character of God. 
The Bible says God is love. I was up in my cave, lived for about a year and a half like a hermit in a cave. I used to cook my own food. And uh, one night while I was cooking my dinner, my cat came in carrying a mouse. I had a cat named Stranger because he just showed up one day. I didn't know where he came from. He lived with me for about a year and then he disappeared one day. But uh, he used to like to catch these kangaroo rats. But you know, cats are a little sadistic. They like to play with their food. And so he would catch this mouse and then he'd, he'd be making these growly noises and then his eyes are real big and he'd let go of it. It would try to hop away and he'd pounce again. And then he'd let go and it would try to escape. He'd pounce again. You ever seen this before, you know? And I'm watching this, I'm thinking, you know, I, it was, I felt sorry for the poor little kangaroo rats are kind of cute. They're not like your common rats or a mouse. They kind of hop around like a little kangaroo, get a long tail with a furry thing on the end of it and, and uh, cute little eyes, <laughs> long whiskers. And, and uh, the poor thing, you know, I keep, I'm, I'm almost rooting for the mouse. And so strangers playing this game and the thing in its days and confusion and desperation, it went to hop away and it hopped twice and landed in my fire. Listen to you. Listen to the gasp that just went through the crowd. Oh, the mouse. Think about that. That mouse, I saw it. It was terrible. You know, a little mouse fought in the fire. I couldn't do anything. It, it, it writhed and squeaked for just a second or two and it died. And I felt awful. I see some of you right now, I'm looking at your faces, you're going, oh, the anguish for the mouse for 10 seconds. You want to do that to a rat. And yet people think God is going to do that to his disobedient children through eternity. This is a terrible doctrine because it distorts the truth of God. All right, question I, I hope I put that on the screen, Matthew 10, 28. Tell you a little story. Um, I was going through the wilderness, I was going through the woods, and um, last year, from our house, I saw lightning strike in August in the Mendocino National Forest. And we saw some wisps of smoke go up. And I was with a friend when we saw that happen. About four days later, I needed to drive across the Mendocino Forest to Highway 5, Interstate 5. And it's like 35, 40 miles of dirt road. And I decided to take off at night. Well, I'm three quarters of the way there. I'm high in these mountains. I frequently had driven those 40 miles without seeing another car. And then at night, I noticed as I was going around the turn, I saw off on the hillside a fire burning. The lightning had struck and the fire was spreading. I thought, well, that's not where I'm going, but boy, that's kind of spooky. And uh, then I kept going and then I came around the corner and I saw the trees were glowing orange, just an orange light. I thought, I hope this isn't what I think because I don't want to turn back. It's a long way around the other way, hours. And I came around a turn and there was a forest fire. It ended up becoming the largest forest fire in California history, and I couldn't believe I was there, and it's burning, and there's nobody around, nobody blocking the road, nobody fighting the fire. They were busy fighting fires in Sonoma. And I thought, well, I wonder how far, I was really being dumb. I thought, the road is open, it's just burning on the right and the left of the road. First, it was just the right of the road. I thought, maybe I can get by this. So I started driving through it. And then I noticed that it was now on both sides of the road, but the road was clear. I said, oh, I don't want to turn around. Maybe I can go a little further. And I started, this is actually a picture I took from my car. I know, you're thinking, Doug, you're dumber than we thought. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Karen, Karen was with me, it would have turned around sooner. And so I'm going a little farther, and then pretty soon smoke started to obscure the road in my headlights, and I thought, this is really dumb. A tree could fall, something could block the road behind me. I don't know how much farther it goes like this. I don't want to burn to death. I said, it is not worth it. As much as I hate driving two extra hours, it's better than dying. 
And so, you know, I had to turn around. I actually stopped once I got out of the fire and I did a little video. I won't show you that right now. But um, that fire, <laughs> we were there when we saw it start. It burned for a month. It was the August fire. And uh, we also, Karen and I were up in the hills with the bulldozer. We saw them finally getting it out a month later, that fire burned. 60 miles you can drive through that burned territory. And I thought, boy, that'd be terrible to burn. But here in California, we're sort of getting a preview of what's going to happen in the last days, huh? Last year and this year. Number 11, for whom will hellfire be kindled? Is God saying, I'm going to start a fire and I'm going to burn all the bad people? Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Who is it principally prepared for? The devil and his angels. The Lord doesn't want anybody to be lost. But he has no choice with the devil. Ultimately, it's going to be those that follow the devil are going to join him in his fate. And um, you can read that parable where God separates the sheep from the goats in Matthew chapter 25. Another quick story. Years ago, uh, up in the hills, we had a cabin. Did not have solar electric back then, but we did have a radio. And on the radio, we'd listen to family radio. They had some great Christian music, and they had somebody some just read through the Bible, and they had some nice programs, and it was kind of my, no internet back then. It was kind of like some inspiration. But the owner of the station would come on once a day and answer Bible questions. And some answers were good, and some were not good. And even though I was just selling wood for a living back then, I wasn't, uh, I guess it had been 40 years ago, I was um, into Bible study very much. And I was listening one night, and this mother called, and uh, she said, welcome to Open Forum. You're on the air, and can I have your question, please? She said, my son died yesterday in a car accident. He made no profession of being a Christian. He struck a tree, and he died instantly. I just need to know, is he burning in hell right now? And the moderator, he sort of tried to skirt the direct question, and you could hear him him and haul a little bit. She said, no. She said, tell me. He wasn't a Christian. I need to know, is he burning in hell right now? He finally came out and said, well, you know, according to the Bible, if a person dies lost, then uh, there's only one option. They're going to be burning in hell. And so you can already hear the weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. <laughs> well, when, when the lady heard that, I heard her choke. And they hung up the phone. I thought that made me so mad. I thought that poor lady. Just can you imagine walking the earth thinking that the rest of your life, one of your children is being tortured? I mean, look how crazy people go when one of their kids are kidnapped. And the kidnappers are tormenting their kids. It's an awful feeling when something like that happens. Then another call came through almost immediately. And this college student said, I'd like to believe in God. And I read about Jesus. And it seems like I could love Jesus. But I don't know how God or Jesus could take these objects that he's created that are already prone towards disobedience. And then when they do what they're already prone to do for the sins of just a brief lifetime, to torment them eternally. There's no justice in that. There's no love in that. I just can't. I don't know how I can love a God like that. And he said, well, who are we to question God? And sin is very terrible, and that's how he has to punish sin. And at this point, I'm, I'm in my cabin up there. I'm hopping up and down. I'm mad. I'm yelling at the radio. Well, this is a one-hour radio program. I had no telephone, no cell phones back then. But I had a neighbor 12 miles away with a phone. I got in my car, and I drove like a maniac for 12 miles to Dr. Simpson's house, and I went charging in. I said, I got to use your phone. And I prayed all the way down that I could get through. I called the radio station. They're always really busy with phone calls. You know, they're never short on, on calls. I called the radio station, got a busy signal. I called again. They picked up. And they said, OK, you've reached the uh, open forum radio program. You please stand by, and you'll hear the moderator come on when it's your turn. And my heart started racing. I drove down the hill. I didn't even know what I was going to say. <laughs> and so finally he said, welcome to Open Forum. You're on the air. Can we have your question, please? I said, I'm a Christian. I'm a Bible Christian. And I believe the Bible is very clear that when a person dies lost, 
they do not go right to hell because the Bible says they remain in the grave, that they stay in the tomb, the judgment day is still future, the resurrection is still future. And he interrupted and started to try and share some more. I said, I also believe that hell does not burn forever. The Bible tells us the wicked are consumed in hell. They turn to ashes. They're burnt up. They're devoured. They perish. They vanish away. They will be no more. No more pain. And I just gave him verse after verse after verse. And uh, this lady's home I was in, she had the radio in the background. I could hear all of a sudden that I was no longer on the radio. He had, he had, he had pressed the mute button. But a lot of it got through. There were still 20 minutes left in the program. He would not take another call. He tried to spend the last 20 minutes of the program trying to unravel what I had done. And um, I drove home that night. I was praying that that mother and that college student were listening. And I said, Lord, I wish I could have a radio program someday and tell people the truth. <laughs> and you know, for the last 28 years or 26 years, we've had Bible Answers Live every Sunday night. Pastor Ross and I, we take Bible questions from around the world, and it is so nice to hear the recognition and the appreciation for clear Bible teaching, because there's a lot of doctrines of devils out there. This idea that God tortures people through eternity for the sins of a brief li lifetime is a doctrine of devils. It, turns, it comes from Greek mythology. The god Pluto, who was in charge of Hades and had found its way into the Christian church, and it discourages so many people. How does the Bible refer to God's destruction of the world? Does the Bible say that the Lord enjoys punishing the wicked? For the Lord will be angry that he might do his work, his awesome work, and bring to pass his act, his strange act, God wants to give life. God makes everything. He created paradise. Everything was good, good, very good. He wants to bless. He's desperate to save. He wants us to have joy. He wants us to have an abundant life. And so when he must, because he is a faithful judge, punish the wicked, it's strange to him. He doesn't do this through eternity. This is a rare occurrence. He does not enjoy it. I remember years ago, we were driving up the hill. I had the kids in the car. And uh, thought we saw a wounded deer in the road. Slowed down. It was night. Went around a corner, and it wasn't a wounded deer. It was a German shepherd pup, probably six months old or something. I thought, look at that. No collar, by itself, way up in the hills. And I jumped out of the car, and I tried to call him, but it, it ran from me. Just, you know, ran about 50 feet away. And it was scared. And uh, our son Micah said, let me try. And so he went out, and he got down on his hands and knees, and he started going. And the dog, when he saw him on his hands and knees, he came to him. He grabbed the dog, put it in the car. We named him Prince, had him for years. He was our family dog, good dog, good German shepherd, enjoyed him very much. He had a dog's life. He was up in the cabin there. Whenever he was hungry, there was dog food, always had it full. When he's thirsty, drink out of the spring. Had hundreds of acres where he could run around. And uh, had, Prince had a great life. Well, after years, he got old, and he ended up getting this uh, disease shepherds get called hip dystocia, where pretty soon he couldn't walk, and that broke our hearts, and pretty soon he was dragging his back legs around, and there wasn't much they could do. And so uh, finally one day, Micah said, I don't want to see Prince suffer anymore. And he said, uh, you know, I'll do it, Dad. He was the oldest of the boys. And he took Prince out and, and did something that is very unpleasant, not because he did not love the dog, but because he did love the dog. And so when God is dealing with the wicked, it's not vengeance. He's not trying to torture people and say, I'm God, I'm going to show you um, how much uh, I hate you and torture him through eternity. Punishing the wicked for God is a strange act. He has no pleasure in that at all. Number 13, does the Bible phrase unquenchable fire indicate, now we're looking at some of the anomalies that people get mixed up on. Does the Bible phrase unquenchable fire indicate that the fire never goes out? Let's read this verse here. Matthew chapter 3, verse 12, it says, he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor, gather his wheat into the barn, and he will burn up. Notice what burn up means. 
When something's burned up, what's left? He will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. i give you another verse here. Look in Jeremiah 17, verse 27. But if you will not heed me to hallow the Sabbath day, such as not carrying a burden when entering the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, then I will kindle a fire in its gates, and it will devour the palaces of Jerusalem, and it shall not be quenched. Now, what does it mean when it says that the fire is unquenchable and it shall not be quenched? Quench is a verb. It means to extinguish. Let me see if I can illustrate this, and I, I know you might get it on the screen. It's going to be far away for some of you here. It's a regular pack of matches. I was surprised I found this. Best Western, probably 30 years old. And I got a match here. And uh, I can do this very carefully here. All right. No fire marshal present, I hope. All right, this is a match. Now, I am going to do my best not to quench this match. But this match is going to be burned with unquenchable fire. So here it is. It's burning. I feel it. It's very real. Woo. Ouch. I'm not going to quench it. You can't make me quench it. I refuse to quench it. What happened? Did I quench it? Quench is a verb. Are there any firemen in hell quenching? No. The fire of hell is going to do its work with an unquenchable fire. No one can extinguish it. Typically, when something catches on fire in our communities, we send fire people and they try to quench it. Will there be anyone to do that in, he in heaven or hell? This is what I'm talking about. Let's get those subjects straight. <laughs> you can read also Mark chapter 9, verse 47. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. For it's better for you to go into the kingdom of God with one eye. Now, is this clear that Jesus is illustrating something here? Will anybody in heaven have one eye? Or one hand? Or one foot? No. Pluck it out. It's better to go to the kingdom of God with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into the fire where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. What does it mean? There are four words that are used in the Bible for hell. Probably should have said this earlier on. You've got the word sheol. It's translated hell. That's a Hebrew word. It simply means the grave. Sheol just means the grave. Then you've got the word Hades. Hades comes from Greek mythology. It was the place of the dead that Pluto was in charge. Keep in mind that all of the Jews understood Greek mythology and um, that uh, they understood what Hades was. And it was a Greek word for the dead. Then you've got the word uh, Gehenna. Gehenna was a valley outside of Jerusalem. It was the city dump, the Valley of Hinnom. Still there today. It's very steep and rocky. You couldn't build on it. And they would typically bring the garbage outside the city. They'd dump it in the Valley of Hinnom. They kept it burning. Dead animals were in there. Worms were in there. That's why Jesus said, better to have one eye and go to heaven than have two eyes and go to the Valley of Hinnom where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Nobody put out the fire in Gehenna. They wanted it to burn to keep the smell and the gases down. And so he's just saying, you know, better that than go to the city dump. Number 14, but doesn't the phrase everlasting fire mean unending? Let's find out. Sodom and Gomorrah are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. The results of the fire and of Sodom and Gomorrah are eternal. Are they still burning today? No. They'll never be there again. If I've got a wooden chair here and I set the chair on fire and I do not quench the fire and that uh, beautifully carved wooden chair is burnt up, that chair was burnt with an everlasting fire. It's gone forever. It's the results of the fire are everlasting. God does not keep the fire burning forever. Does anyone really believe the parable of the rich man and Lazarus? that it's literal, that Abraham and the saved will be in the city of God, will be looking over the walls into uh, an abyss where the wicked are writhing and burning forever and ever? That's clearly a parable. Someone write that down. I'll, I'll spend more time explaining that tomorrow. People look at that one parable in Luke, and it's in a list of parables, 
and they take it literally like the people in heaven and hell are going to be talking to each other. Sodom and Gomorrah are the example. You know, years ago I was in uh, Naples in our school. I was living on a boat that sailed around the Mediterranean. It went to Mount Vesuvius, uh, and at the foot of Mount Vesuvius, which is an active volcano, you had the ruins that had been discovered of Pompeii. The cities of Pompeii and Herculeum were destroyed in 79 AD. I heard one historian say that some of the soldiers that were helping destroy Jerusalem in 70 AD had been uh, dismissed and were vacationing in Pompeii. Some of these very soldiers that had um, burnt up the city of Jerusalem in the temple. They had several earthquakes. People did not heed the warnings. Vesuvius blew up. A few people escaped that were by the shore. But most people were caught as they were in the ashes that fell, and they were destroyed in this fire, frozen in position. Very little warning. The pyroclastic cloud that came down superheated just scorched them. And they're still doing an excavation there today. And this is what it was like in Sodom and Gomorrah. This is what it's going to be like in the last days. Jesus said, in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man comes. The wicked are destroyed by the brightness of his coming. So some people are destroyed when Jesus comes, the ones who are alive. They're then resurrected, judged, and they will, they're going to get uh, thrown into the lake of fire and be like refried beans twice. Revelation 15, when Revelation 20, verse 10 says that the wicked will be tormented forever and ever, doesn't that indicate endless time? Let the Bible interpret itself. Does that sound fair? Let's look at another verse. Jonah, chapter 2, verse 6. The earth with her bars closed behind me forever. How long? Forever. How long was Jonah in the big fish or the whale? And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. And I thought before, I probably felt like forever. Not only was maybe Jonah on the menu, but he could have had appetizers that were, you know, stinging jellyfish and squid and, and sea urchins or something in there. And he's in there with all these things flashing and the stomach acid of a fish. That'd be awful. Three days and three nights. No watch to see how much time had passed. Probably felt like forever. And the sufferings of the wicked. Think about it. For the wicked who know that they've lost eternal life, their final thought becomes an eternal thought. That they missed out on eternity. Read in Revelation 14, 11, The smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever. These are the verses that people often use. When it says the smoke ascends up forever and ever, well, I used to drive across Texas, and every 10 miles they had a city dump. There's a town every 10 miles in Texas. You go to West Texas. And you would see they kept the dumps burning. They, they burned their garbage at their house in these metal cans. And then they go dump it at the city dump. And often it was still burning when they dumped it out. And you could see smoke. If the wind wasn't blowing, it would go up forever and ever. That just means out of sight. Have you ever used the expression, well, I haven't seen them in forever? Is it literally forever or is it a figure of speech? It's called hyperbole. And so the Lord is saying that here. You have to look at the context. So what does the expression forever and ever mean? Let the Bible explain it. Look, for instance, in Exodus 21, 6. If a servant loved his master, even after six years where he would be allowed to go free, he went through a ritual, and the Bible says he will stay with his master and serve him forever. Well, forever there meant until he died. It didn't mean that in heaven he's going to still be serving his master forever had an end with his death. Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 22, when his mother brought him to the temple to serve in the temple, it said, there he will abide forever. Well, is he still there today? No, it meant as long as he lived. You still with me? Yes. You look also again in 1 Samuel 1, 28. It tells us how long it was. He'll serve forever, and then it says as long as he lives. The people who are cast into the lake of fire are punished varying amounts based on what they deserve, but they will ultimately be burned up, the Bible says. The Bible says burned up. No more root, no more branches, ashes. You will go forth from the new Jerusalem. You will tread upon the wicked, for they are ashes under the soles of your feet. Also in Malachi. Forever and ever is a biblical expression, which means until the end of the age, it's not necessarily an infinite, unending length of time. Praise God for that. After sin and sinners are destroyed, what will Jesus do for his people? 
This is a beautiful message, friends. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth in which dwells righteousness. Are sinners immortalized? Does God give eternity to the devil? I mean, wouldn't you be worried that he might escape again? It's always amazing to me that they captured uh, that drug lord and someone made a tunnel to this top security prison there in Mexico, a one-mile tunnel underground, and they made, managed to go right up into his restroom so he could escape from a federal um, prison there. Uh, and you think, well, what if the devil got away? He'd be on the loose again. No, Satan is going to be destroyed. Sinners are going to be destroyed. Look at what it says in Revelation 21, verse 4. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there'll be no more death. How much death? No sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain. How could God say there? All things are made new. Former things are passed away. All things are made new if there's immortalized old sinners. How could he say there'll be no more pain if you've got this chasm somewhere where you've got ostensibly billions of people, because we all know more people are lost than saved. You know that? Wide is the gate that goes to destruction. Narrow is the way that leads to life, and few there be that find it. And the idea that God would take most of the human race and put them in a torture chamber for ceaseless ages, screaming in agony, and God says, no more pain. No, there will be a new universe that is pure. There will be no more pain. Number 17. Will the sin problem ever rise again? You can read in the book of Nahum 1 verse 9, affliction will not rise up the second time. People have wondered when we get into eternity that uh, what's going to prevent it from ever happening again? You know, Christ, when he rose from the dead, he still had the nail prints in his hands, didn't he? And are, are we going to ever forget what he paid for us? Are we going to ever forget the pain that sin cost Jesus? Jesus died on the cross to save us from that pain. Does any parent, any creator, want their children to experience eternal pain? Jesus wanted to save us from that pain. And when we see the scars in his hands, that'll be the guarantee that no one will want to ever experiment with sin again. Love will keep us from it. Isaiah 65, verse 17, Behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth. The former will not be remembered or come into mind. That doesn't mean we're going to forget the good things. It means the painful memories are forever gone. Question number 18. This is our last question. What penetrating question does Job ask? That righteous man said, Can a mortal man be more righteous than God? I think I've illustrated tonight there's probably not a person here that, uh, I sure hope not, if you had a dog that was a bad dog, would you kick and punish that dog forever because it made a mess or tore up your clothes or did whatever? Look how patient we are with our pets. Some people have pets, they take over their lives. Amen? You bring home a puppy and it tears everything apart, chews everything out, we think they're so cute. We wouldn't do that to our dog. And yet people think that they would, that God's going to do that to his disobedient children. Job says, is, righteous, is any man more righteous than God? God is certainly more loving and merciful. There is a penalty for sin. Don't be confused. There is hell. And in some ways, the hell that I'm teaching is hotter than a Baptist hell. Their hell just kind of barbecues people forever. Ours burns them up. And so there is a lake of fire. You don't want to tamper with that. You don't want to know about it. But God is a loving God. You can trust him. He's going to bring sin to an end. There'll be no more pain or suffering. More than anything, Jesus wants you to dwell with him in this glorious kingdom. He longs for you to occupy your mansion that he's prepared for you. Would you like to decide now to follow him? I'd like to invite John to come up and sing, and I'd like to, uh, and Kelly to play. I'd just like to have a prayer with you before we close that um, you'll come to study these things for yourself. Look at the scriptures. Look at your lesson. 
and believe the good news that God has about his character. There's a land that is fairer than day And by faith we can see it afar For the Father waits over the way To prepare us a dwelling place there in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore this truth it just liberated me to love God I could see that God was not only a loving father he was a just judge a just king a kind creator it just changed my whole perspective and I believe there's people out there that maybe have been raised with a view of God that he's uh, angry up in the heavens and and uh, wanting to torture his disobedient children and I hope this will give you a new picture you believe you can love God friends Amen. You know, why don't we bow our heads together? Let me pray. And then after I pray, I wonder if we could stand together. And we're going to sing the chorus of that song John was just singing. Father in heaven, we just thank you for your goodness. We thank you, Lord, for the truth in your word that you are a loving God. And I pray that you'll be in a special way with some that are struggling with these principles and this scriptural truth, that they'll come to know and believe that the way that you deal with the lost and the wicked is in love and in justice. I pray that you be with each person. We all go through struggles, Lord. We know that Jesus came to save us from our sins, and we believe that you can do that. Bless each person, Lord. And help us get a new beginning in Christ. We pray in his name. Amen. Why don't we stand together? Now, let's sing the chorus. I bet you can do it without the words. In the sweet by and by. In the sweet shall meet on that beautiful shore in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore amen friends this is why we're doing these meetings we want to see people in the kingdom amen, amen. when is our next meeting tonight and we have another meeting tomorrow evening. Tonight we're going to talk about the Devil's Dungeon. We'll be studying the truth about the millennium. And then after that we meet again Tuesday night, Wednesday night, on through November 13. You can still bring your friends. God bless you. We look forward to seeing you then.